A man with a heavy accent approaches me. He proposes to tell me a story in return for a cigarette. I promise him the whole pack of F6s if he only makes it brief. Oy vey, a story from the shtetl. There are Jews again in East Berlin and they all find me. They have their Judar on. The story is about two Polish towns separated by many miles. One town is rich and has developed quite a taste for sin. The townspeople built themselves an achingly beautiful synagogue with a nicely sculpted ark. Inside that ark, an antique Torah scroll is kept. Nobody knows exactly how old it is. Old, yeah, very old, how old, time of Moshe, yeah? And although the sinfulness of the town is kept indoors and out of sight, the Lord looks deep inside a man's heart, and when the Torah is passed around during the Shabbat service, the letters tremble for fear of brushing too closely against those awful sinners. The inhabitants of the second town are poor as dirt. They have a tiny synagogue and their ark is empty. The congregation is simply too poor to, av to afford parchment and the services of a scribe. And yet they scrimp and save because an ark needs a Torah. They buy a bunch of sheepskins from a traveling salesman and they bring in a sh cheap scribe from Lot's. Not a very good one, one who likes to hit the bottle and so he doesn't have a very steady hand. The man sells the pieces of sheepskin together and he has a good stiff drink with the rabbi and after that he gets tired. When he gets to his cottage, he lies down next to the open scroll and starts snoring. At midnight, the scribe wakes up. A strange glow illuminates the room. The window is suddenly blown open and letters fly inside, a stream of letters one after the other. The letters dive for the table where the scroll is spread open and they arrange themselves on the parchment, one after the other, each in its proper place. The writer, drunk with wine and sleep and religious awe, falls to his knees and presses his forehead into the dirt and shuts his eyes tight. When he opens them again, the glow has gone and the window is closed and the scroll on the table is black with letters and words and sentences and stories and the scribe begins to read. And when he establishes that the scroll is complete and that it contains the totality of the law from the creation of the world to Moshe's death, he puts on his sandals and runs out yelling and screaming and waking people people up to tell them of the miracle. And the townspeople pile into the cottage to see the scroll, and they too fall on their knees in amazement. And the inhabitants of the first town are also wide awake, because their rabbi heard noises in their temple and saw a light in their ark. And they too are staring at the scroll of parchment in amazement, except that their scroll is empty. The inhabitants of the poor town are very proud of their Torah, and when it's carried around the temple, the faithful push each other away to touch it with the fringes of their taluses, for this Torah, or so it is said, has healing powers. I sip my beer and I hand the storyteller the promised pack of cigarettes. And what's the moral of this story, I ask, that we are better off poor and decent? No, the moral is that God retreats from those who need him most. Thank you, I mumble, thank you. The man's Talmudic wisdom is completely in agreement with my own observations. And of course, the rabbi of the poor town didn't pay the copyist one cent, I presume. After all, the Lord himself did all the work. Right on, says the man. Words, I say, and I slip the man an extra ten mark note. Russian horror, Jewish storyteller, they all work at the same rate. Um, it's always very awkward to read your own words in a bookstore, especially if people are standing in, in the back. I apologize for that. Um, th there's maybe some room with some back support in, in, in front of the bookcases here. Um, the story starts with um, a man with a heavy accent. I, I apologize for mine. Um, I come from Belgium originally. I'm Flemish. Americans are typically too uh, polite when you say you're Flemish to ask what is Flemish and, and can it be cured. Um, the Flanders, which is where people who are Flemish come from, is the northern part of Belgium where people speak Dutch. Um, the southern part of Belgium is where people speak French. That's a really nice chair. Um, that's, that's, that's a place of honor. Um, you probably hear much more of Flanders in the news in the days to come. We had elections in June. We still don't have a government. And the last I heard was that the French-speaking parties wanted a government of national unity. Whenever a country calls for a government of national unity and it gets one, the next step is AKA uh, 47s and mortar fire. And then the Americans come in to carpet bomb you to stabilize the region. I guess you'll probably hear about this um, in the news soon. I did everything I could to get rid of my accent, including marrying an American, and um, that even that um, didn't help. <laughs> um, 
Um, I'm here to read the book or present the book. I guess the reason why I'm reading from these papers is that this thing is simply too heavy for me to carry. And um, the publisher also pressed all the letters very nicely together, so I actually can't physically read it to you. Um, I'm too old um, for that now. I, I like reading this story because it's basically somebody else's story. These are Talmudic stories, except that I think I came up with a moral for this story. Um, another reason to read this is that you know when you have the DVD, you need outtakes. So this is an outtake. It, my, um, when I translated this thing myself, and when the publisher saw in there that I said write on and I had somebody say write on and answer with word, they thought it was a little bit too much 1980s Bronx slang. Um, so they had me change this, and um, I changed it, and I think you are right, and then amen, um, assuming that the publisher would catch that no illegal Jews in um, communist um, Eastern Germany would say amen to each other in a bar, but apparently they thought that that was okay. So. That's a strange mistake that's, that's still in the book. Um, it's hard to describe what the book is about. I've, I've tried many times. If I have to do this in seven words, I always say it's about the important things in life, war, love, death, sex, pigeons, food, and blasphemy. Um, I can interchange the, the, the pigeons with quantum mechanics or quantum physics, and most quantum physicists I know say that pigeons and quantum physics is the same thing, basically. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to read two or three pieces today, or three or four. Um, out of the book, and then maybe, um, depending on whether people who are standing in the back still have stamina, um, maybe a, a shorter piece. Um, the book is basically the story of two Jewish boys born in the 1920s. Um, one is lucky because his mother literally talks her way out of Nazi Germany, and he ends up in the United States and starts working for the uh, Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, and starts having second thoughts about what it is they're doing, especially in the, towards the end of the war. If you build a nuclear bomb, it's likely you're going to use it, right? Um, the other uh, boy stays behind in Berlin, unbeknownst to himself. He kind of starts working for the resistance, um, gets caught, ends up in Auschwitz, escapes just in time. And it's him we meet in this bar in 1961, um, where he is waiting for the Stasi, the Secret Service, to pick him up because he has said something very bad about the regime um, television. Um, I'd like to read a piece now that's, I think, slightly more entertaining. It's um, called the Obscenity Trilogy, and the F word, I think, will be used exactly three or four times um, in this piece. So if you don't like the F word, you have about 15 seconds um, to get out. I should also actually read the F word with an Australian accent. Um, I have a colleague from New Zealand, so I was going to ask him how you pronounce that, but, but then I thought that maybe I shouldn't. Um, so this is my imitation of an imitation of an Australian accent, I guess. Um, the next piece, because the book is also obviously about the Holocaust, is um, a lot less um, entertaining in a light vein, I guess. So, um, But um, here we go. This is part from a chapter called The Obscenity Trilogy. Bloody fucking crowds. Danny's facial hair is truly monumental. An impressively frazzled beard and the mane of a lion. It's good to be equipped with a natural filtering device when eating at the Potsdam student restaurant. Thick banks of cigarette smoke float majestically through the long hall. It's hard to see your plate through the smog, and that's probably for the best. Many school particles, particles of bratwurst shoot out of Danny's mouth, and the little balls of fat slide over the tabletop as if it were a newly polished skating rink. They fly over the edge and land squarely in my lap. Thank you. Danny. I had passed on the sausage, although it was the plat du jour. The meat, if that was what it was, had been floating in a pool of what looked like pus. Fluorescent bubbles the size of cat's eyes were bobbing in the liquid. I made the understandable mistake, it was my first Friday here, to nod my head in the direction of their pizza. Nobody stopped me, although everybody in the room must have known that Friday's pizza was not a food item but a search engine, topped with the mercilessly burnt memories of every item that had been on the past week's menu. Putin geschnetzeltes Brathering mit Schwiebelringen, Sekret in der Gulasch, Kyros, Pfanne, Hähn und Haxen, Frikadelle, Fleischermeister, and who knows what these things are. Anyway, if you look deep enough into the crust, you might even find remains of last week's pizza, a multi-layered Troy minus the buried treasure. Postdoctoral research abroad, it sounds quite exciting if you do what I do. Less than a week ago at my going away party in Leuven, Belgium, 
I had waxed lyrical about the idea. We are the new nomads, I had asserted with an uncharacteristic boldness that had its origin in the gallons of Riesling and boxes of schnapps that my already slightly plastered friends had schlepped into my apartment. I'm not used to drinking. We are the gypsies of science. And I was not completely wrong. We are bohemians by necessity. A postdoc salary is too low for comfort and too high for starvation. So we shop at thrift stores, looking halfway homeless in our fraying blue jeans and baggy gray sweaters. And we wear our beards ragged, and of course there's no money for a decent haircut. We get a student discount without ever having to show our student ID. The ultimate dream of the European postdoctoral researcher will always be America. We are not happy with the occasional trip to a conference in Minneapolis or San Francisco. No, we all aspire to one day experiencing the full metamorphosis, the transfer to Princeton or Yale or Cornell or Stanford, to any of those mythical places that represent the true world centers of learning. We ignore the rumors of the hell of a so-called voluntary 60-hour work week. We forget the misery of having to produce way too many and therefore way too sloppy papers. We don't consider what will happen if funding doesn't come through. And we disregard the continuous humiliation of having to teach a herd of hormonally wrecked kids who couldn't care less about their education, although they must have paid 25,000 bucks for each year of it. Millionaires dressed by choice in wrinkly free t-shirts and shorts drooping down to their ankles. America, the promised land, the great attractor, the limit cycle oscillator of our academic existence. Hotel California and the sagging couch in its lobby that one too many travelers have had to spend the night on because all rooms were taken. This is the heartland of quarter gallon coffee mugs, Hawaiian shirts and football of hot dogs and nachos and liquid cheese, of deep dish pizzas and hard candy, of Twizzlers, Dots and M&Ms, of peanut butter and jelly, the land that invented the hamburger, that perfected the bagel, that shrunk and hardened the pretzel, the new homeland of the cheesecake. The land where the real English is spoken is spoken not the language of Shakespeare and Sir Lawrence Olivier, but of Ronald Reagan and Bruce Springsteen, the vowels held together by one of chewing gum. Where girls in big hairdos spray every visible part of their bodies with cherry perfume and their boyfriends swagger like bears as if their smoothly shaven testicles were made out of bronze, each family jewel weighing 20 pounds or thereabouts. We postdoctoral hopefuls practice this grisly walk in front of the mirror and buy a Yankees baseball cap just to see how we look with the bill turned backwards. We look ridiculous. We are looking forward to meeting masked raccoons, their little guns in hand, raiding our garbage cans for the shredded evidence of our scientific productivity. We cast ourselves in the role of scientific pioneers in a country where everything has been done at least once before. Our direct competitors lean nonchalantly against the door frame, their thumbs hooked in the belt loops of their cowboy pants, and they mumble, let's do lunch someday. Such challenges will no doubt strengthen us and drive us ever onward and upward. Going to America by way of Potsdam, who am I kidding? Not Danny. Danny's six months of service are over. He does research on the effects of semantics on numerical cognition. More specifically, he's collecting proof of the existence of an abrupt boundary between subitizing and counting. What did you just say, subitizing? Not exactly the kind of stuff that makes non-psychologists go wild with enthusiasm. Whenever I go to a party and I mention that I do research in the field of psychology, I get surrounded by an eager bunch of bright-eyed folks. I am their savior, a man who understands them deeply, a man who will read their inner cores and somehow foresee their future. I will change their lives forever. I apologize sheepishly. Sorry, I say I'm not that kind of psychologist. And then I run off to the kitchen. There's always a heap of dishes to do at parties, and doing dishes is wonderful therapy for the shy and the beleaguered. Then he doesn't run off to the kitchen at parties. He's prepared. He comes with his own small arsenal of stories. His favorite anecdote is the one about the pigeons. Everybody who's ever worked in a pigeon lab knows that his animals get drunk with joy when they see their caretaker walk into the room, but that the other students' pigeons couldn't care less. Danny and one of his graduate student buddies at the lab of Adelaide, Will Food, were going to prove once and for all and scientifically that pigeons do indeed recognize their caretakers. As you know, graduate students will do anything to postpone writing their dissertations. The Skinner boxes in the lab, smooth prisons of plywood painted black on the inside, were equipped with two plexiglass keys, small transparent levers. When a pigeon pecks the correct key, a lamp lights up and a food pellet rolls into the cage. 
pigeons have tiny pigeon brains, and those brains are used almost exclusively for the fine art of foraging. They are hungry all the time and always came for food. If they want to get a complete meal out of their session in the box, the pigeons have to be very alert. As a consequence, they keep peering out of their little window in keen anticipation, eagerly examining their world, a computer screen of this, for anything that could possibly lead to a food delivery. For the who is Danny and who is Will experiment, Will and Danny removed the computer monitor. Instead, the two men presented themselves as stimuli, jumping in front of the window in random order. The pigeons can hear the rattling of the dice. Will is even and Dan is um, obviously odd, uh, but they have no idea what that sound is. Maybe it's a fresh bag of pellets being emptied in the chute. Hmm. A head appears at the window. It's Will. Head disappears. A pack. Another head. It's Danny. Head goes away. Head reappears. Let's try another pack again. Will. Pack on the Will key. Pellet. Yum. And Will again. Pack on the Danny key. No pellet. Danny, pack, Danny, Danny, pack, Will, Will, pack, 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 Will, Danny, Danny, Danny. Danny steps out his cigarette. But there's a problem, he says. Danny is a skin-ass guy with a beard, and so is Will. The pigeons get confused. They're not very successful. They get hungry. They get grumpy. Pack, pack, pack. But after a while, they do learn. If you keep this game up for an hour or so, the pigeons finally start answering with a great deal of precision. They'll even tilt their little heads a bit to the side, looking proud and clever. So here's the questions. Have the pigeons really learned who is Will and who is Danny? I don't need to think about that one, not necessarily. They could just be picking up on peripheral cues. Maybe Will is wearing a dress shirt and Danny a t-shirt. Danny lets out a happy shout. Great, so what do we do next? That's also a no-brainer. You guys come in wearing identical lab coats. Danny is delighted. Very good idea. But our idea was even better. We simply stripped. Yoo-hoo! Butt-naked Danny. Goodness gracious, butt-naked Will. And it made the effect disappear. The learning curves were completely flat. So, how do pigeons recognize their caretakers? I don't know. Danny shrugs his shoulders. Is it the smell? I just keep going. Is it certain consistent details in the peripheral cues, or maybe they don't recognize us at all? Maybe it's an illusory correlation that only exists in the lab assistant's minds. Then he gets irritated. He's done with this story, and I'm asking way too many questions. I didn't know you guys were still working with pigeons, I say. Skinner is long dead, and so are his animals. These days, the claim is that Skinner's methods and the signs of animal behavior can't teach us anything about the things that really matter in life. Sex, for instance, or friendship, or language, or art, or literature, or French cuisine, and the amazing allure of black olives. Ah, then he takes another bite. My experiment was the last one of its kind in Adelaide. Damned cognitive revolution. We couldn't get anything published anymore, and somewhere higher up in the university, where they think money is important, somebody took notice. They stopped subsidizing us. Fucking bloody administration types. And what can you do with a lab full of jobless pigeons? There was a suggestion, not a serious suggestion, mind you, to have our Moroccan research fellow cook us a nice pastilla. Filo dough, almonds, puree of apricots, cinnamon, add tender pigeon meat. Now we were going to set the pigeons free, of course. So there we all go on a sunny afternoon, late in summer, in procession, with tears in our eyes, and we carry our birds in improvised cages to the park to release them there. The pigeons are cooing nervously. They scrape their little claws against the plastic bottoms of bor borrowed parrot cages and the cardboard of shoe boxes. They beat their wings against the walls of perforated paper bags and Chinese takeout styrofoam. They stick their little beaks out of improvised air holes in extra large Tupperware containers. In the park, we form a circle in the grass, as requested by our resident Feng Shui expert, and then we throw the lids of the containers. Take to the air, dear friends. Go fly into the golden sunlight, free, free at last. But that isn't what happens. We have to shake the cages. We have to turn the boxes upside down. Some of the birds immediately scramble back into captivity. We have to wrestle them out of the cages and onto the grass. None of the expected shrieks of joy, no happy flapping of pigeon wings in the limitless sky. They all huddle together on the lawn, scared shitless, pecking their feathers and trying to find perches with their stumpy feet in the loose gravel. Their little heads are rotating like antennas, and what are they looking for? Us, of course, us. They trust. We're the guys and gals who offer them food and scratch their heads, and so suddenly they all decide to run towards us. 
beaks wide open, clock clucking away. I swear to God, the wild pigeons in the trees are rolling off their branches with laughter. <laughs> and so there we are, flapping our arms like windmills, showing our pigeons how it's done. Fly, dear friends, don't be scared, go on, fly. And so there they are, taken aback, staring at us with big dumb pigeon eyes. You can see them thinking, what the hell? <laughs> so we run directly at them, thinking we can maybe scare them into flight. But even that doesn't work. Like a nervous flock of gray mini sheep, they fan out over the lawn, but they don't spread their wings. Only when Will gets a little toy pistol out of his pocket and starts shooting in the air do they take off with a mighty whoosh all at the same time. That is an incredible moment. Those dry pops and the smell of gunpowder and actually feeling the pigeons finally lift off like a single cloud, like a small reverse tornado, an explosion of wings in the sunset, a momentary eclipse of the sun, and then it's all over. They settle in the lime trees, nervous and visibly confused. And then gray feathers start whirling down from the sky. The wild pigeons, the mob that owns the park, are ganging up on the newcomers and they engage in some seriously vigorous pecking and a group rape ensues on a massive scale. Pigeons don't scream, right? Is that what you think? Pigeons can't scream? Well, let me tell you. We sprinted out of that park as fast as we could, covering our ears with our hands and none of us ever set foot in the place again. See, another fine example of how classical conditioning actually works in daily life. My friend Will Food later became a true cognitivist. He studies extrasensory perception. He shaved cats and glued electrodes on their skulls. Then he went to a soundproof room at the other end of the hallway and tortured their kittens. Let's see if that leads to a spike in mommy's brain waves. See her there? Then he nods his head in the direction of a strawberry blonde, paper-thin young woman with a wild head full of tangled curls. All she has on her tray is an apple. She's fucking Italian. The apparition, cloaked in mist, holds my attention for a second. For some reason, fucking Italian sounds better than fucking German. Much, much better. The next piece, how are you guys holding up in the back? Okay, um, I apologize for the lack of chairs, even though that isn't um, my fault, I guess. Um, the, the next piece is um, more serious, um, and we are, um, we're into um, 1938 at this point. Um, one of the things I found very, very intriguing when I was um, researching um, this novel, by the way, when writers talk about researching, this has nothing to do with what people at universities think are researching, you're just reading up on stuff that is fun and um, you know, trying out things like how long does it take you to go from point A to point B in Berlin, is there actually a post office open at 11 p.m. and if so what is the nearest bar which is of course the, the, the real reason why you do um, this research. Um, one of the things that um, struck me when I was researching um, this book and, and the history of the Holocaust was the insidiousness of the process and how how slow it goes. Um, I think for me the book actually started when I was a postdoc in 95 in Potsdam, Germany by some weird coincidence um, and the first weekend I was there I, I wanted to go to Berlin which is about 20 miles out of um, Potsdam and this being Europe you have an excellent train connection and then um, an excellent subway to get you to places and I said where should I go and um, one of my German colleagues said um, well you go to the town of course I said where do I go and he said well maybe you should try in Dimitra which is the, the old center of town so I come out of the subway and I'm on this fast open square um, lined with neoclassical buildings and in the middle of the square there's a light that seems to come out of um, out of the pavement so I walk over there and there's a big glass plate that's where the light shines out of and when you peer inside you see uh, just white bookcases like these cases except that they're white uh, cheap billy bookcases from Ikea that most of us know and hate um, and they're empty and there's a little plaque um, on top of the glass plate that has a quote from Heinrich Heine, a German Jewish writer from, and the quote is from 1820 and it says roughly translated that was only the beginning there where one starts with burning books, one will burn humans um, in the end. Um, that's the place where you had the book burning in 1933 um, and indeed it, it progressed and um, these were words that were written 113 years before um, it happened. Um, so I've always been 
surprised at how quickly people got to this to the end point of the Holocaust, but it's really true. If you burn books and nobody protests, then you can start burning shops and synagogues and nobody protests and, and in the end if you export the tariff far enough outside the original boundaries of your country nobody um, will protest again. So this piece I guess is a fictional account of some of this although I, I try when I write fiction especially about this to not exaggerate. You can exaggerate in a fun piece but you can't exaggerate here because it's really necessary to not do that and, and be true. Um, to what happens. Um, what, what interested me here in, in this story um, is um, not just how you can make the story work, but also what is the story behind the story and what is the story that the regime or the government tells you is what is happening versus what, um, what is really happening. Um, this is um, about 15 minutes or so and it comes from a chapter called Fire and Frost. Grüneberg, Karl Israel, is working overtime. He has locked the door and turned over the signs showing his hours, but the store shutters are still up. He will lower them when he goes home. Karl Israel has a reason to stay late, a secret reason. That reason is Monica. Karl Israel enjoys his quiet thinking time, especially in the extended dusk of November. To think without thinking, to let his mind wander along the merrily indefinable paths minds like to wander along, to meditate upon her, his lovely accountant who will forever be out of reach. Karl Israel likes to let the molecules of Monica's daily presence in the store sink into the back rooms of his consciousness. After these musings, it's wonderful to take the last tram home or on those not infrequent occasions when he fails to wake from his trance before the public transportation system shuts down to walk home under the street lamps, the first cautious snowflakes of the season landing in his hair. Grüneberg is a noble man, and quite smart too. His thoughts are honorable. He keeps his distance. Monica is Aryan. Since the Nuremberg laws went into effect, any sexual encounters between their two races are strictly prohibited. And what's prohibited is prohibited. That's just the way it is. You have to have some kind of order in the land. Law regulates order. So there you go. Everyone takes his spot under the sun, and everybody does what he's supposed to do. But the man is still allowed to dream isn't he? Kruneberg's dreams are extraordinarily chaste. He dreams of mountain hikes in the Schwabische Alp. He dreams of a little hotel with homestyle cooking and an open fire in the dining room. He dreams of sitting in on a clumsy recital by an unknown local pianist in the town hall. Perhaps the man will play a modest set of Mozart sonatas for them. Does Monica even like Mozart? In his daydreams, Grüneberg drifts as far away as possible, far away from everybody who knows the two of them, to a place where nobody could conceivably notice their ethnic differences, where nobody would be bothered by their love. And while he dreams away, he fulfills the mechanical duties of a shop owner. He checks the stock, he refolds the shirts, he straightens the lines of moccasins, he rearranges the man's ties, he cleans the display cases with his breath and the sleeve of his shirt. He's in the back room, getting out the books when he hears noise in the shop. Not again, he thinks. In the summer, the good-for-nothings had painted slogans on his windows. It had been quite a pain to scrape the glass clean. Fortunately, nobody had protested while he did this. For all he knew, the government now had a law that prohibited the removal of anti-Semitic graffiti. But nobody had offered any help either. Not even Monica. She had ducked underneath this ladder to enter the store and she had blushed. Grüneberg steps into the main room maybe a bit more briskly than he should have. Never let on that you're upset, it only makes matters worse. A man stands in the doorway. We're closed, says Grüneberg. Grüneberg needs his quiet time, he needs his peace. Why don't people understand that? That even somebody like Karl Israel needs his peace, his quiet time. The man is in uniform. So many people walk around in uniform these days. This observation fills Grüneberg with a mild surprise, as though he's realizing this only now, for the first time after five long years of Nazi rule. How had the man been able to get in? The door had been locked, hadn't it? Watch the man's hand. That hand is swaying loosely by his side, dragged down by a heavy weight. A polished bat of maple wood lies in that hand. It gleams in the yellow light that flows in freely through the wide open door. The silver aureole of crushed glass is pooled around the man's feet. But so late in the evening. In June, the brown shirts had done their window smashing during daytime. 
Monica was in the jewelry store when ten young men in Hitler Jugend uniforms broke through the windows, waving kitchen knives in the air. The official Hitler, Hitler Jugend dagger must have been too precious to soil with Jewish blood. They screamed that the Sudeten Germans needed space, should they be given lodgings in the Jewish stores then, and then they proceeded to slide rows of golden rings over their slender boy's fingers, briskly lined the pockets of their uniforms with watches and pearl necklaces. It took just a few minutes. Then they hopped out the window again, a boyish prank, Grüneberg had thought. An expensive prank, but still a prank. Monica thought otherwise. She had been very upset, and she had run to Carl's store to see if everything was okay there. Upset and relieved at the same time, she had, for a brief, all too brief moment, put her head on Carl Israel's shoulder. For a brief, all too brief moment, Carl Israel had intoned a soothing na-na in her ear, and he had whispered, hey girl, it's not that bad, while his open hand circled her back. And now, one of those boyish pranksters had materialized right in front of Carl's own two eyes. The intruder advances two or three steps. He peers at the shaken merchant's face. He slides more than he walks. He is a snake on supple boots of leather. He stops right in front of Grüneberg. The bat rolls on the floor. The man has simply released it. When he reaches for Grüneberg's temples with a mother's tenderness, with both hands he relieves the store owner of his glasses. He sticks them in his own breast pocket. The man is blonde, but in a strange and hazy way. His eyes are the icy blue color of a summer lake. His mouth has a melancholic quality with a grin of almost compassion at its corners. Here is a man who looks at another man intently, a predator assessing the fear that lies behind the eyes of his prey. It's not hard to understand what's going on here. Here are a man in his bath, and it is late at night. The man speaks softly. Karl Israel has to strain to understand him. Assaults have to be chaotic and amateurish, Herr Grüneberg, and somewhat random, right? Do you understand? Do you agree, Herr Grüneberg? That is what the man says. It almost sounds like an apology. Then he spits out the word, the word that serves as the signal. Jude. All flesh is grass. We are all straw dogs about to be thrown into the sacrificial fire. Lilies of the fields wither in the heat of summer. Birds fall exhausted from the sky. The carp freezes in December's ice. Even a young man's bones are brittle. Such is life. A troop, a horde, a full wolf pack invades the star. The slivers of glass in their souls stare up the carpet. Their bats and clubs sing the songs of the ages. They whistle and they wheeze and then they splinter whatever they touch in rhythm. The blonde giant behind him now throws his arms around Grüneberg and presses the merchant's back against his chest. He forces Grüneberg's sagging chin up with his hand. Watch this, don't miss this. You have to see this part. Revenge for Paris. With a crashing sound, the shelves come down. The mob rips the coat racks out of the wall and puts them to good use. They smash the windows with the long poles. The diamond dust of freshly crushed glass covers the gold tie bars and the inlaid tie tacks. They quickly grab whatever they can. They throw the stuff into a small truck that is conveniently parked in front of the store. Coats, a few handful of cufflinks, ties, jewelry, all are hastily loaded into the van. When they're almost done, they drag Grüneberg to the street. Somebody hoists him up, and a woman hands him a torch. Grüneberg shakes his head. She insists. Doch, she says. And again she presents him with a flame, while another member of the gang kicks him carefully in the shins. Fire means liberation, the leader whispers in his ear. A brand new start. What do you say? To start all over again with a perfectly clean slate. Isn't that what we all long for, Mr. Grüneberg? The woman moves the flame back and forth in front of his face, almost scorching his beard in the process. With her free hand, she unexpectedly grabs him by the balls and squeezes. No, he shakes his head. He doesn't want to do this. Doch, she says. Doch. And with her knee, she kicks him hard in the groin. Grüneberg doubles over. Two men fold his hands around the torch. Then they throw their victim, flames and all, into the store. The dry carpet ignites with a mighty sucking sound. Grüneberg has just enough energy to crawl to the exit, coughing, retching, crying, while the last of the jolly looters jump over him on their way out. In the glow of the fire, the blond man dusts himself off with perfect poise. 
orangey red accents and deep blue shadows flicker over his tranquil face. He takes one last look at Grüneberg. It is no more than a brief glance in passing, the glance we give a drunkard who sleeps off his booze in the street. This reminds the man of something. His hands slide into his breast pocket. Yes, the glasses have survived. He puts them on his own nose, those tiny spectacles made of horn and gold. They look good on him and he doesn't squint. He and Grüneberg must have the same prescription. A neighbor drags the merchant's slim body further up the street. That is the only reason Grüneberg survives. Then another neighbor calls the police. A Jew is disturbing the peace. He's lying right in the middle of the street, obstructing traffic. They come to get him, the cops. After that, Karl Israel curses his life. What happened? Far away in Paris, a German diplomat has died. The smoking gun lies at the feet of a startled and speechless Jew, Hermann Herschel Greenspan. The Germans know perfectly well who to how to avenge that murder. 250 synagogues go up in flames, 7,500 stores are looted, 100 people know 100 Jews are killed in cold blood, and 3,500 people know 3,500 Jews end up in jail. It appears that Greenspan had a lot of accomplices. Finally, the mask has been ripped off the worldwide Jewish conspiracy. How can the diplomat's murder be an isolated incident? It must be part of a well-orchestrated campaign with roots in either Jerusalem or Brooklyn, or maybe both. Greenspan is hardly 18. Once again, the international Jewish conspiracy has exploited a naive and innocent youth. Here is the official version. Greenspan wanted to take revenge for the deportation of his family from Hanover to Poland. In the early morning of November 7th, he walks into the embassy and requests an interview with Ambassador Welzek. Instead, he gets to meet Ernst vom Rath, a low-ranking diplomat. Greenspan assumes that the man standing in front of him is Welzek and he shoots the hapless civil servant in the guts. The man is carried to the hospital and for two days vom Rath is stuck between life and death. The newspaper headlines go into overdrive. Every hour the radio transmits a news bulletin with the latest reports from the two doctors that ministered to vom Rath. Hitler had them flown in from Berlin. One of his own personal physicians is among them. Then on November 9th, at half past five in the afternoon, right on the anniversary of Hitler's first attempt at a coup d'etat, vom Rath finally succumbs to his wounds, the first victim in the war that international Jewry is waging against the Third Reich. What is the truth? Greenspan is a confused young man in a sloppy raincoat with a furtive glance and a cigarette glued permanently to the corner of his mouth. He is a James Dean of all la lettre, a boyish man who made the heart of every Parisian who ever crossed him in the street go giddy up. He could have made a woman melt with just a wink of his eye if only he wanted to, but he didn't. Greenspan bought a revolver in A la fine lame in the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Martin. It cost 245 francs. He loaded it in the restroom of the bar Tout va bien, a place he frequented often. It was the bar where he met from Rat, a gay bar. At half past nine, Greenspan rings the bell at the embassy. The embassy isn't open to the public yet. The wife of the concierge, maybe she recognizes him from earlier visits, lets him in. He tells her he needs to show the secretary an important document. She ushers him into a waiting room. The secretary of the secretary, Herna Gorka, enters the waiting room. No, Greenspan needs to hand over the document in person. He has a personal communication to make as well. The secretary will surely understand. Just tell him Herr Greenspan is here. Fomrat asks Nagorka to let Greenspan in. No, there's no need to sign him in. A few minutes later, a shot is heard. It's easy to guess the reason. In 1937, Vomrat returned to Germany from his post in Calcutta with an intestinal problem. In Berlin, he is treated at the Röntgen Institute of Professor Dr. Halberstetter and Dr. Tugendreich. The records show that the therapy is shortwave radiation, the ten usual cure for intestinal infection with gonorrhea. Both of the doctors are Jewish. Going to Jewish doctors is Vom Rath's way of keeping his condition quiet. Most probably the cure was not completely effective. Rectal gonorrhea is very contagious. 
from rat almost certainly infected Greenspun. He signed the young man's death warrant with a shot of his sperm. This then is the extent of the conspiracy of world Jewry. The Nazi pig that the Jewish doctors try to save is killed off by another poor Jew with nothing to lose. Perhaps Greenspun did his lover a favor, dying quickly from a bullet wound in the gut. Isn't that preferable to the slow rot of intestinal infection? When night falls over Berlin, men in brown uniforms pour into the streets. They stop every car with a driver that looks Jewish. In boundless empathy with their dying compatriot in Paris, they smash the car's headlights. In a dizzying display of solidarity with a poor innocent diplomat, they kick in the windshield. Then, in a further immensely affectionate gesture of unity with the unfortunate secretary, they open the driver's door and punch him full in the mouth, brass knuckles hidden underneath their rough gloves. With infinite tenderness, they push the Jew's head backward until he screams with his mouth wide open, and with the tip of their billy clubs, they rake his teeth out of his mouth, all to the greater glory of the fine diplomat from Rat, until the alley is littered with teeth and blood. This seems like a bad place to end the reading, right? Yes. Um, I have another um, short piece, uh, probably about five minutes or so, that is... Um, are we still okay on time? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is more of a throwaway piece. This was um, commissioned by the Brussels Jazz Orchestra, which um, many people, I guess, assume is an oxymoron. Um, you can have jazz in, in Brussels. Um, a year ago or so, um, somebody there, um, well, he had this lifelong infatuation with Billie Holiday, and um, he had the idea of bringing six writers together um, to do something around Billie Holiday. And as these things go in Belgium, he had one Flemish guy, that was me, one French-speaking guy, one real French guy, one real Dutch guy, one um, Afro-Caribbean author who now lives in the Northeast, that was Carol Phillips, and um, one Nigerian writer who lives um, in Holland. And um, the piece I was working on um, was a, a song that Billie Holiday didn't write herself and only performed because she was in a movie um, called Do You Know What It Means to Miss New Orleans, which is, of course, a wrong title. It should have been Do You Know What It Means to Miss New Orleans. Um, as we all know, but the person who wrote the song originally um, had never in his life left Manhattan, and um, if you know the song, um, it talks about sweet sugar pines, and sugar pines grow in California. They don't grow in Louisiana. Um, the, the song, as you probably all know, um, became after Hurricane Katrina some kind of, of national hymn for, for New Orleans. Um, the reason why I chose this, I guess, was, was part, partly because of the background story which you were asked to tell um, at, as well at, at the performance. Um, this was originally going to be a song for a movie, and the movie was made, but the movie was originally going to be made by Orson Welles, and then he got sidetracked. Um, it was supposed to be a story on uh, the origin of jazz. Imagine a movie on the origin of jazz by um, Orson Welles with Billie Holiday and Louis Armstrong in it. Um, that one didn't happen. Um, Orson Welles got sidetracked, and somebody else made the movie into a very sappy um, love story, um, including that they put Billie Holiday in a maid's uniform. Now, Billie Holiday worked very hard all her life to become Lady Day, so she was very dismayed that she was put into a maid's uniform, and she rebelled by um, appearing very late on the set whenever there was a musical number to be performed. Um, this um, had the purpose of first irating um, the other stars of the film, and that worked. The other reason was that musicians get paid by the hour, whether they play or not. So if she arrived two hours later, her fellow musicians um, would get paid a little bit more, which she thought was um, a good thing, and um, that probably is the case. While um, Wells was still thinking about the movie, um, Billy Holiday was actually his um, lover, and he, um, he asked her to take him around the um, ditzy joints in Los Angeles where he thought he otherwise wouldn't be welcome on his own. Um, and that's, that's another interesting part of, of Orson Welles' life, um, I guess. The reason, of course, why I said yes to do this thing is that um, there's nothing as nice as performing with uh, when you read a piece and then suddenly there's a jazz orchestra of 20 folks that you know, starts blasting right next to you. Um, that is wonderful. So when, when I read this, piece, it's called Babylon Blues. You, I guess, have to imagine that there's an orchestra sitting there vamping, da, 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 something like this. 
St. Louis Cemetery number one lies underneath the water line. The coffins are drowning. The undertakers have holes drilled into the sides, but when it rains, the coffins go floating in the pits. You can hear them rattling at the underside of the gravestones. That is only true, of course, for the Protestants. The Catholics have their own peculiar death rites. I met her at the Ace Hardware store on Oak Street. We were both eyeing the quickly diminishing piles of plywood. You look like the kind of guy that knows how to wield a hammer, she said. I'm a writer, not a carpenter. The quill and the tumbler are the tools of my trade. She sees me often at the famous door, she says, quite possibly. And I bet you have a car. So we bind the boards to the roof of my dinky Toyota. First, we board up the windows of her shotgun house in Bywater, then we drive over to the View Carré. I like your t-shirt, I say. The front reads, Babylon. The back says, and on, and on, and on. She does not reply. Then she says, casually, the least I can do is buy you a beer. The city loves to snuggle up to the drowsy river. The Mississippi, soggy with the sediment of the collective dreams of this feeble continent, sways slow and drunken through its bed of mud and heavy metals, but not today. Today, the wind whips foamy crests on the water, a dirty surf licks the levee. In the narrow window of Reverend Zombie's voodoo shop, the leg bottles are shaking. Azuli stares with wide open eyes over the vast emptiness of the quarter. The bars are closed. Pat O'Brien's, Johnny White's, Molly's, the cat's meow, all empty boxes of unreachable promise. I must have a bottle of something or other on top of my fridge. And the quarter is on higher grounds than the rest of the city. In my apartment, we will surely weather the storm. The Catholics, I said, have their own rights. The Catholics are smarter. They do not bury their loved ones. They shove them in narrow alcoves high above ground. In the heat of the eternal Louisiana summer, they slow cook their dead. After a year of baking, the remains are shaken into a cotton bag and thrust to the back of the niche to make room for the newly deceased. Perhaps it is cooler in the back. Once I too stood at the grave of Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen. I knocked three times on the hollow cover. With her gold-rimmed lipstick, my girlfriend drew three crosses on the wall. We left the lipstick there in the dirt, a meager offering. We hoped Marie would like the color, rouge sensation. Apparently, she didn't. The baby never came, and my girlfriend packed her suitcase. Did the rain start? The pale light in the room is compatible with the hypothesis of rain, softly filtered, phlegmatic, and pure, a study for an alchemy in blue. The CD player hiccups. The lamp on the nightstand flickers. The power plant delivers its final sob. Girl, you gotta love your man. She grabs a cigarette and gathers the sheet around her. She steps onto the balcony. The windows are nailed shut. The door is still open. The very last board, meant to closes in completely, bangs against the railing. I step into my boxer shorts and press myself against her. The wind, a hot, lush breath against our necks. We fit well together. How often, how closely, how warmly can strangers fit together. There's another shipwrecked couple on the other side of the street. They wave at us from their balcony. Forty-somethings, the man, sorry, the woman sports a motherly layer of fat, the man, a ponytail. They decided they did not need a sheet nor boxer shorts. And while our neighbors merrily proceed with their copulation, we raise our eyes to the heavens and watch the fraying clouds nibble at the fraying moon. And there we have the first drops of the fraying rain. Time to hammer those last nails. When I'm done, I slither down the drain pipe. My bare feet land in a puddle of glimmering slime. I run upstairs and slide next to her in bed. The darkness is palpable the night a bath of ink. Why me? I ask. I'm a dime a dozen. Why Noe? She asked. After the Lord commanded his flood, he needed a just man, just one, one just man and his companion. It didn't matter that the just man was a drunkard. He was steadfast, watchful, gentle, and firm. You are my just man. You are steadfast, watchful, gentle, and firm. She promises me this. If by accident the world will drown again tonight, the two of us will populate the earth. The rain rages against the plywood. 
a hellish wind. This is no whistling, no howling, no wailing. This is a throbbing, thumping sound. All the fury of the West African continent condensed into one gigantic, boiling, pounding fist. Here comes the fuming black devil, Satan, to tear up the town with hurried, bloody claws. In St. Louis Cemetery number one, the Protestants must be dancing. The Catholic souls take a breather from the heat. I take her in my arms. Life is what happens when you stop asking questions. The wind is shaking the foundation. The rain is thrashing the walls. Tomorrow, I say, all of this will be over. She agrees. Tomorrow, little boy, everything will be over. Thank you. We could do a question and answer if you want. This is also a good time to escape whether your legs are hurting or your head or, or anything else. Um, how, how do you come up with the title? Oh, goodness. Um, titles are always... Um, I'm, I'm very, very bad with titles. Um, I had a colleague who emailed me this weekend and, and asked if this was a science fiction novel, given the title, and, and he would love to read it if it was a science fiction novel. So I tried to convince him it was not a science fiction novel, and then he said, well, there's physics in there, that's science and it's fiction, so I think I'll buy it after all. Um, the Dutch original version had the Shiva on the cover because the Shiva image comes back a lot in, in the novel. It's um, a creation um, through destruction. Um, and the atomic bomb is a very good, good example of that. And kind of if you look at the Shiva, dancing Shiva, is this ring of flames with somebody dancing inside it. And you could kind of see an atomic explosion, if you want, in, into that dancing circle, um, which made my Dutch publisher at one point say, oh, right, that's, you're the one who wrote that book on Hindu mythology, right? Yeah. So um, the reason for the title, I'm, I'm sorry for the roundabout thing, um, is that in the, the cover story or the framing story is set in 19. 50 years after the war ends, and, and for good reason. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of physics. Um, some people have called it a thriller, and, and if there's a, a thriller element behind it, it's the question what happened to the German um, atomic bomb project. We know what happened to the Manhattan Project, but at the end of the war, when the Allied forces went into Germany very quickly, the Americans had a special task force that was there before they were actually legally allowed to be in there uh, to look for the atomic bomb project. They found a very primitive reactor in a cave underneath a church somewhere um, in Bavaria. Um, and Heisenberg was standing very proudly next to it saying, look what we've done, we, we can tell you all about this if you want. Um, he said it with a heavier German accent, but I won't try to do that. Um, and so um, it's an interesting question what happened to the atomic bomb project in Germany, and nobody knows. Actually, um, Heisenberg has a different accounts of it. His um, mentor, um, advisor Niels Bohr, has different accounts of it. Um, and so I have... In, in, in the fictitious book, um, or in the fictitious part of the book, something terrible happens um, on the 50th anniversary. All of this is then um, a way to, to backtrack that I needed a physicist in the novel. And this physicist is working on what Einstein called his biggest mistake, which is the cosmological constant. Um, when we look out there in the universe, we can see a lot of things, and we can see them light up. It's, it's stars. But um, I, I have been told that there's a lot more matter out there that we can't see, and we don't know what it is. It's not planets. It's not dust. It must be some elementary particle that's zooming around. Um, there's apparently about five times as much of this dark matter than of the, the the matter we see, and um, current day physicists capture this in a parameter that they call omega. Ah, there we go, omega. Um, um, I also used omega because of its shape. Um, it can look like you know, a mushroom cloud, for instance. Um, if you have a dirty mind and you look at the um, lower case omega, you can see other things in there as well. I have been told that there's way too much sex um, in the book. Um, so that, that could be another thing. Um, it could um, refer to Teilhard de Chardin's philosophy of omega as the ultimate point where humanity is going to. And so when I was you know, getting all these references for omega and there's other ones, uh, when I was heaping them up, I was going like, this is very heavy stuff. So um, the, the title omega would not be good. And maybe I need to qualify this and saying it's not that bad. So that's why it became omega minor. And again, my publisher should have stopped me, but um, they, they didn't. Sorry for the long answer. Other questions? 
comments, rants, complaints. Well, wait, it's about it's cognitive psychology. I read that is a big part of it. Is that true? It's some part of it. Yes, I'm a, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I actually think that the pigeon chapter is the only real chapter where uh, the cognitive psychology shines through. But um, it, it's hard. To, sometimes people ask, too, when, uh, would, would it have been a different novel if you were not an academic or a psychologist or something like that or a scientist? And I, I don't know. You know. The thing we need is what psychologists call an ABAB design. I need to be a scientist, and I don't need to be a scientist. In it. So you, you can't do that. Um, what I think is very important and um, that, that may be different. Um, I, I work at Georgia Tech, which is an engineering school, and engineers are thought that you have problems, and problems have solutions, and there's a good solution to your problem, and that fits. In psychology, the problem we are trying to study is this thing inside your bone box. We'll never be able to figure that out, so um, that, that's good. That's why many people start, uh, started in the 30s, I guess, with pigeons, because bird brains are small. You can hope to understand those. You really can't hope to understand the, the human brain. Um, that, that doesn't matter. We shouldn't keep trying. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I was, well, this pigeon thing would seem more like a behavior. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're cognitive. I guess I was wondering, like, is there more about specifically cognitive psychology? Well, I think the book is probably is informed by me being a cognitive psychologist and think about things like memory and um, not to ruin anybody's reading pleasure, the unreliability of memory, the constructiveness of memory. Um, the more you study memory, and especially the more you read all the literature on memory, the less you trust your own memory. There's, you know, it's very easy to implant memories in people. It's very easy to forget things, as, as we all know. And if you've ever tried, you know, if, if you've taken a, a vacation trip with somebody five years ago and then you get back together and you try to uh, reconstruct what happened on that trip, that might be very, very difficult. Um, for me as a psychologist, I think one of the things I've learned is that it's much more important to ask the right questions than to come up with the right answers. That's where, where I went with the engineering spiel. And I think as a writer, I do the same thing. People have tried to solve, say, the riddle of why the Holocaust and what happened, and we can't. But it's really, really important to keep asking that question and to find out that you cannot answer it and to ask that question again and f try to approach it from another side and know you really can't answer it. And um, that's the way psychologists like to work because we, we have these questions and we try to answer them through different ways and we'll never solve them. And we're, actually, I think, in some weird way perfectly fine with just finding small pieces of the answer, something like that. <laughs> I, yes? I'd be interested in hearing um, what you have to say about how you balance your being as a writer and your being as a scientist that is you should balance that. But yeah, I don't know if I do. <laughs> um, but one of the things I find, I find liberating, and this is very trite, but um, I come from a culture in Europe where you assume that a writer is a writer and does nothing else. Like probably the archetype in Europe is Günter Grass, the, the German writer, who sits and writes and pontificates. That's the two things you do: you're a pundit and you write. Um, whereas here in the States, there's more the idea of the writer who then also teaches or does other things um, by the side. Um, I think it was really important for me that this thing is 250,000 words. It's 690 pages. Um, God help you when you try to read this thing. Um, God help you when you try to write this thing. So you, I never started out trying to write this, this many things. Um, and, and that's, I guess, important. For me, it's really important as an academic. Somebody pays the bills and you do interesting things. That's, that's great fun. There's no, no, I don't think there's any better job in the world than being an, an academic in that sense, except for the teaching. You set your own agenda and you do what, what you do, which gave me the time and the opportunity because I started thinking about the book in 1995 Five, to really take the time to take nine years to do the research, to read up on stuff, to let it just sit and simmer, um, and then come back to it and then finally write it. So in a way, being an academic freed me up for, for other things. I don't know about balance because I tend to find actually that when I'm in a creative 
um, spell, it tends to work in both directions. So suddenly I get ideas for research and then I get ideas for a book. One of the big differences is that if you write, you better have one good idea per page or um, nobody will keep on reading. Um, if you're an academic, you can get by with a good idea every five years or so. Um, so that, 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 that is a difference. It has to be a big enough idea, but um, I really don't, I don't even know if I, if I balance. That's, um, yeah. Yes? Did you make any discoveries of the drone writing as we're translating? Yes. Um, <laughs> the, um, you have to be crazy to translate this too, right? Um, so the, the translation was subsidized in part by um, the Flemish Fund for Literature. And in order to do this, um, you have to be um, uh, registered with them as a translator. The reason why I did the translation was that um, the Flemish Fund, they tried to sell these translations to, to other countries. Um, the German translation came out a year ago. Um, the French translation, are, they're starting on right now. Um, is that they, they make trial translations and so I was reading a trial translation of, of, of a couple of pages and I was reading this I was going like this this is this is perfect English and it's a very good translation but it's just not my voice that's the first time I discovered I had a voice in English so which was a, a, a nice and interesting moment so that's one of the things I discovered and so I felt that I needed to do this and, and I talked to my publisher if I could do this and they said stupidly enough yes you, you can do this it's also, also I found out especially if it's a thing book the only way you ever make money on a book is actually translating it rather than than selling it um, because you know you, none of you has, has ever been lusting for a Flemish novel in translation have you um, so um, it, the, I, I got very very lucky one of the things I discovered while I was translating this was that I had a voice that I could find out when I was deviating from it um, and so needed to get back the other thing I was figuring out was that how woefully inadequate woefully inadequate sorry there I go already my English is um, so I had to really work work very hard on that what was the most difficult thing to translate is and um, that doesn't really work well in the English yet because my English isn't is far from perfect is that I write very melodiously I, I, I write so you can read it and it has a rhythm etc in, in Dutch and to translate that into English was very very hard